Hey guys, Stockaholics, thank you guys for being here today. Happy New Year. Tankers in 2022, the darkest before dawn. Uh, in this video, I'll be talking about my thoughts on tankers. We'll take a look at scrapping rates, some developments, and share some of my thoughts as we go through. And so as of where we are today, we are deep in the winter months, uh, January of 2022 now. And this is the time when you would expect to see the highest uh, earnings for tankers in any given year, Q4 and Q1. And uh, the earnings are still very much lousy. Uh, the product segment has, uh, for short periods, made a buck or two. And crude has very much been loss making through, I think, the entire winter. Uh, and is likely to stay that way, I think, for the rest of this winter. Um, there was some cautious optimism, I think, in both in myself and a lot of um, tanker bulls out there, uh, which is a, a dwindling crowd, I might add, which is one of the things I like to see as a contrarian, by the way. <laughs> but um, what we are seeing here, I think, demonstrates that there is probably an oversupply of vessels, which I think I've said a few times before. As we are approaching 2019 levels of um, demand, the and rates still are not improving, this shows that there, there very much has to be uh, an oversupply of vessels. Now, I will say that I am still increasingly bullish on tankers despite this, and I'm going to show you guys why in the coming slides. And so let's take a look at scrapping. This, These are the scrapping numbers as of December 17th, so this is a few weeks old. Um, I have seen another source. Uh, most of the time I look at this uh, website, Compass Maritime. Um, there's another site, I think, Vessels Value, that have updated it since December 17th. I guess these guys are on vacation. They haven't updated in a few weeks. But I'd expect these guys to update um, probably this Friday, so we'll see. Uh, maybe I'll post that on Twitter if you guys are interested, uh, Those the numbers that we saw in total in uh, 2021. Um, but for 2021, we saw um, 20 ULCCs and VLCCs scrap total. I think the actual amount of VLCCs is around 14, if that matters to you. Uh, it doesn't matter to me because they all carry crude and ULCCs, although they're light, mostly used for storage, they carry even more. So I'm thinking total capacity of ships on the water, right? We saw 14 Suez Maxes, 34 Aframaxes, and 11 Panamaxes. The amount of scrapping that took place last year was more than 2019 and 2020 for all of those seg all of those vessel types combined. I've recently read a bunch of articles out there that still say, say things like scrapping is very low in tankers. And when I read this, I just, I don't get it. Because when I look at scrapping on a historical basis, these are the kinds of levels of scrapping that you typically see during the first year of a scrap cycle. 2019 and 2020 were times when tankers earned a lot of money. During this time, they were not incentivized to go and scrap. They were incentivized to go store oil during the contango and deliver oil when we saw Trump sanctions and all that kind of thing in 2019. So they're earning a lot of money. And these cycles, the scrap cycles, usually take about 18 to 24 months to start. And this is now we are deep in this scrap cycle. So when I read these articles that say, oh, the scrapping is low, I'm like, what are you guys talking about? Have you looked at historical <laughs> scrapping? This is about what you'd expect, if not more, right? And I think what they're doing is they're comparing these to the new builds that are hitting the water. So they're saying, okay, well, the new builds are, were, are coming, they're hitting the water, and this number exceeds the scrapping, right? To me, this logic doesn't really make a lot of sense. You guys can let me know if you agree with my thoughts or disagree with them. Because the new builds that were coming uh, were started a couple of years back when they were ordered. They were always coming in the first place. Whereas these scrap, the scrap that took place uh, in 2021, that didn't necessarily need to happen, right? So I think I just, I don't, I'm, I find I'm tried to keep an open mind with this, but uh, this is a, a reasonably high level of scrapping for 2021. And what I expect is that in 2022, if this uh, cycle mirrors like a lot of the cycles you've seen in the past, we will see even more scrapping taking place. Now, um, last year I had a hypothesis that we would probably see diminished levels of scrapping during the winter months because uh, I, I believe, well, it would seem like a lot of these owners would probably try and hang on to their vessels to the winter months because that's usually when you would try and see um, you would see more earnings for your vessel, right? And um, 
what I've noticed through this winter months is that scrapping has remained on pace, if not exceeded, especially for some of these larger vessels during uh, November and December. We're still seeing extremely high levels of scrapping. And uh, what we also see is that scrap steel prices are still very, very much uh, elevated. Now, I think that this is probably going to roll over pretty soon. Um, uh, <laughs> I've been saying that for a long time, though. So it's been a weird, weird uh, year or two for commodities. But um, if my hypothesis was true that the, in the past that um, tanker owners were holding on for those winter months, then I think that the likelihood that you see increase scrapping next year is even uh, higher, especially as these uh, scrap steel prices stay uh, elevated. Uh, again, what we see in these scrap cycles in the past is that you have one or two years where the, you see really high uh, or kind of marginal levels of scrapping. And then after that, if um, there is a lot of old vessels on the market, which there is, and there is very low uh, earnings, then you see even higher levels of scrapping. So I am anticipating next year that um, the numbers we just saw last year, you know, times that one by one and a half. And <laughs> those are the kind of levels of extrapping, scrapping I expect to see this year. Okay, this is a slide taken from Euronav. Main reason I wanted to show you this, uh, show this to you guys, is because it shows us that there is a tremendous amount of ships, far more that is on the current order book, that are slated to be in scrapping age. They're likely to be scrapping candidates in the next couple of years. The, the ships that are 20 year, years and old plus, the majority of them are involved in the Iran illicit trade where they are transporting uh, sanctioned oil largely to China. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of talks in Iran. This might change. I have no idea if those sanctions will be lifted or, or if they won't. But if they do, you can expect to see a large number of these vessels being scrapped. Now, Iran does have a small fleet of their own, and it's about half of these vessels. So you can assume if um, Iran joins the normal uh, trading world again, then uh, you can instantly, maybe not instantly, but rapidly remove a bunch of these vessels. Now, I don't know if these guys are going to be subject to a lot of the behaviors that other tanker owners are, where they wait 18 to 24 months. We've seen some of these sanctioned uh, vessels being scrapped already. That might suggest that the um, sanction trade is uh, is at max level already, where these guys are already not really making money in that trade either. So time will tell on that. But what's coming down the pike in the next couple of years is that you have an even larger segment of vessels that are in these very high ages as well. And when you get to that 15, you get to that 20 year mark, your expenses for your vessels increase also. And you have uh, increasing levels of environmental regulation that put pressure on these. You have again, you see this spread between those the um, the high high sulfur fuel oil and the low sulfur fuel oil. And when you have these older vessels and you're in a really shitty market and you're in a really shitty market for a long time, you are highly incentivized to uh, to um, to uh, destroy some of these vessels. What we have seen in during prolonged troughs is that the average scrapping age actually diminishes. And I think that the probability uh, beyond um, 20, which is the normal, uh, lower than 20, which is the normal kind of scrapping age. Uh, if you look past the GFC, a few, few years after that, when people realized that the, the trade was kind of done, you saw the average scrapping age decrease to about 18. And I wouldn't be surprised if you see that in the coming years if um, the fleet does not rebalance. And uh, we also still see very low order book, right? If you think about the average age of a vessel lasting about 20 years under normal circumstances, right? That means that the the um, for the the fleet to remain static, and again, demand uh, oil demand generally t keeps tends to keep growing. In order for the fleet to stay at, at a static size, that order book needs to be uh, about. Um, 15% because this is uh, taking about a three-year uh, time time frame, right? So that means that the order book needs to be at a 5% uh, per year. And this is uh, about 6% lower than it needs to be just to, to maintain the fleet in the coming years. And so again, you'll see all of these articles mentioning all of these vessels that were previously ordered. Um, 
maybe a year or two back hitting the market and saying, well, there's, there's not enough scrapping, right? Again, I don't, I don't follow the logic in that because again, these vessels were always coming. The vessels leaving didn't always need to leave, right? But what you can see is that in the coming uh, years, the order book is very, 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 very low. And in fact, in 23, you're seeing almost no vessels being ordered. And this year, we've seen very low levels of ordering as well. So again, you're going to start to see in the coming years, if not this year or the next, that the fleet is going to be balanced because there's not enough ordering. There's too many old ships. This is the container ship uh, rate index, the Freitos Baltic global freight index and containers have been making a ton of money for a while now uh, i've been saying i thought that this is going to roll over i thought it probably would have rolled over by now or at least begun to roll over at least more significantly than it is but from a perspective for tankers this is awesome because the, the behaviors that uh, ship owners always have is that the longer these guys have um, strong earnings the more that these guys go out and they order new ships we already see that the order book for uh, shipyards is flooded with con container ships and some other types of ships, which I'll show you in a second. And I expect in the next year, if these rates persist, they will continue to order new ships. So as flooded as the market is now with, or is gonna be with these new markets, it'll be even uh, new ships, it'll be even more flooded uh, in the future, the longer these rates persist. And you can also see this in LNG and LPG, although they're a smaller segment relative to container ships, but still, the more ships that you have in different segments earning tons of money, the more difficult it is for uh, tanker owners to go and order new ships. And again, that's what we've seen over the last uh, year or so in terms of ordering. And uh, this I would expect that you will continue to see very low ordering um, this year as well for um, product and crude. I also quick anecdote for dry bulk. This is why I'm still pretty bullish on um, dry bulk as well, because despite them having reasonable earnings last year, they still haven't ordered um, significant levels of ships, much like some of those other segments have. We've been playing this uh, COVID game now for a couple of years, and I think that there are signs that these things are beginning to change. Now, I've been thinking that they would have changed um, by now. Uh, one of the, th probably my predictions that I've been the most wrong on is how long we've been playing this game, but <laughs> here we are. And um, a quick anecdote, I'm a teacher and we probably have some of the more stricter uh, restrictions in terms of this uh, this. COVID game we've been playing. And uh, what we have begin to see is some of these restrictions easing. Uh, now, uh, where I work, that there was a period when if you were in contact with someone who had COVID or you had COVID, you had to go on lockdown for uh, 10 or so days. They're easing that, um, that period, uh, that, what do you call it, the quarantine period by half to, to five days. So Signs that the pendulum may be beginning to, to, to change, right? Okay. Um, what has been the biggest overhang for tankers in terms of um, demand, and demand is a lot harder to predict than uh, supply, I, I think. But the biggest overhang in demand for um, tankers has been jet fuel demand. We've been about 2 million barrels per day short of pre-pandemic levels which is really fascinating to me because if you you realize that you know we're approaching pre-pandemic levels of oil demand with that jet uh, jet fuel overhang uh, in the coming years I think there's a potential we see a very high uh, levels of oil demand higher than we are uh, at least right now maybe a few more million barrels per day right I wanted to share this uh, quick blurb. This is from the IEA. A surge in new COVID cases is expected to slow the recovery in global oil demand with air travel and jet fuel most affected. This was taken in December. And I think by most accounts, uh, people were unsure about the Omicron variant. What I am seeing, and I just live in the Twitterverse. I'm not a, a virologist or anything. <laughs> what I've seen from most people is that this is uh, the equivalent of largely a head cold. Uh, it is 
Uh, many people believe that this is highly positive that we're going to finally end this game because it is uh, more likely to turn uh, COVID from a pandemic into an endemic, right? But in any case, on average, oil demand has been revised down by 100,000 uh, barrels per day since last month's report from both 2021 and 2022. Uh, I already, I do know that OPEC uh, had the option to cancel their um, output hike and they're not. They're sticking with their output hikes that they have previously agreed to. And that is with knowing all of this uh, Omicron stuff, right? Global oil demand is now set to rise by 5.4 million barrels per day in 2021. That was from 2020, very low base, and by 3.3 million barrels per day in 2022. Now, I want to ask the question, could there be a demand squeeze if you see this 3.3 being revised upwards to maybe, I don't know, maybe not the full amount of you know, jet fuel coming back on the market, but let's say half of the missing jet fuel comes back on the market. Let's say that reaches 4.3 million barrels per day. And let's say that scrapping continues in tankers. The chance that at some point in the very near future, we see tankers earn positive rates and significant positive rates when that balance swings in term in the tanker owner's favor, they're gonna earn a lot of money for a really long time. And again, you think about that uh, the order book, the next couple of years, you're not gonna see uh, significant levels of tankers hitting the market when you think 2024, 2025, 2026. And you see the, the mark, the container, the shipbuilders flooded with these um, these container ships and other vessels, the for you to get new supply of tankers on the market is going to take a very long time. And during that time, in the next couple of years, you're going to continue most likely to see even more oil increases in oil demand. So this is why, despite rates being horrible right now, tankers, I'm so very bullish on this segment. Global oil production is poised to outpace demand from December, led by growth in the U.S. and OPEC plus countries. As this upward trend extends into 2022, lifting overall non-OPEC plus output by 1.8 million barrels per day in 2022. Saudi Arabia and Russia could also hit records if remaining OPEC plus cuts are fully unwound. One of the um, potential problems, I guess, with this, um, this thesis, I guess you would say, is that some people believe that OPEC plus is spare capacity is actually understated. They may not be able to produce enough oil. If that is the case, that could potentially be uh, bearish for tankers, but I'm also invested in oil. So either way, it's a, it's, uh, it's a win for me, I guess. <laughs> that, that would push uh, oil prices extremely high. And actually, um, like, typically what you see when you see uh, very high uh, oil prices, you tend to see more and more market inefficiencies. So even if there's maybe not enough um, in terms of um, ton mile demand for uh, shipping vessels, commodity vessels, uh, even though you might not see enough um, supply to match demand, that supply might be sourced from very inefficient routes. So there is still even the potential um, from uh, a... Uh, a OPEC not being able to meet supply that you could still see um, rates in tankers still being um, quite quite uh, elevated as well. Again, one of the, the big things that we hear a lot in the tanker space lately is Iran. And right now the, there's those talks taking place between Iran and a lot of, I guess, uh, different powers in the world about removing those sanctions and Iran being able to uh, rejoin world trade. If Iran does rejoin uh, world trade, there is a significant amount of vessels involved in that illicit trade. There are some VLCCs and there are also uh, some Suez Maxes. Um, I've read some different numbers out, out there. Uh, I don't know if these, uh, I, would take, I would take these ones as probably more true, <laughs> but I have heard some numbers that, um, that the numbers are even bigger than these is, is somewhere in the hundreds of vessels being uh, traded in that listed trade. Most of these are very, very, very old vessels. And again, if those sanctions are lifted and Iran is able to rejoin world trade, almost all of these are very likely to be scrapped 
Uh, again, I don't know if this will take place instantly. I don't know if they'll try and hang on to their tonnage, much like a lot of other tankers do for that 18 to 24 month period. I'm sure some of them might. Some of them might try and get rid of their vessels right away. But eventually a, a tremendous amount, if not all of these, will, will likely hit the uh, scrapyard in the coming years if these Iran sanctions are lifted. Now, there is a small amount um, in the Ir uh, Iranian fleet as well. These are more likely to return to trade, but the amount of those is significantly smaller than um, the uh, vessels that are currently in the uh, illicit trade. Now, um, I think last year, or maybe it was very late 2020, uh, I flipped bearish on uh, oil tankers and um, I sold my positions. And the reason for this, no, no, it was, it was early uh, 2021, like uh, spring sometime. The reason I turned bearish is because I thought that the, the um, supply overhang was uh, unlikely to be rectified during that year. And I thought that there was too much um, market optimism in the space of the time. And so I sold out of tankers um, for a profit. Now, uh, the late summer um, last year, I decided to buy back in. And that was after a lot of these names uh, crashed by 50 or so percent. Where we are now um, in the cycle, I don't know when this cycle is going to change, but I know that it will. And this is like one of those questions you hear, I think Rick Rule, he's, he says this, if you have to ask the question when, you're asking the right question, <laughs> right? Because you, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And so where we are now in the oil tanker cycle with all of the factors that I've mentioned, for me, I don't think that I'll be doing that again. I'll be riding this and I'm likely to either ride it into the next couple of years and into positive earnings and therefore higher share price appreciation and some dividend with uh, the tanker companies I own or I'm going to lose it <laughs> on this investment. Uh, this is too, we're getting to the point in the cycle that it is, in my opinion, too late to be playing any games. Um, and so I guess it's time to ride or die. Let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Uh, have a happy new year and I'll see you guys soon.